Good afternoon. My name is Anthony Pugh, Political Action Director for the NHLA. Our next speaker is a well-known podcaster, blogger, and entrepreneur. He does two daily podcasts with a combined audience of 35,000 listeners. His work has been featured in the Dallas Morning News, Chicago Tribune, Freedom Watch with the Judge, and Mike in the Morning Show. He is the contributing editor for Survival.com magazine and former staff columnist for LouRockwell.com. Here to discuss with us the 12 planks of modern survivalism, we are pleased to welcome Jack Spierko. Uh, thanks everybody for having me out here today. Uh, you guys have been awesome right from the get-go. I've heard about Free State uh, for a long time now, and uh, I can tell you that I am completely blown away. Everything I thought I knew was true, and then there's like 10 more levels. So you guys just rock, and thanks for having me here. Um, I also had a great PowerPoint for you that I'll be using, but you won't be seeing because the projector doesn't want me. I guess I was shut down by the New World Order or something. I don't know You know how these crazy survivalists are. Um, but what I want to kind of do is set the stage for what I'm going to talk about today. I've developed a 12-part philosophy for what I call modern survivalism. And I'm a marketer, so I use the term survivalism because that's what people look for. But it's just really practical preparedness. But if you, if you uh, set up your site to attract people looking for practical preparedness, nobody shows up. Uh, so I call it survivalism, and it really is, because we're all survivalists, and if you doubt that, stand in front of a moving truck and see how long it takes before your instincts kick in and you move. But when we get presented in the media, and there's this you know, new show called Doomsday Preppers, and I just heard that there's Doomsday Bunkers coming out from a competing network because they're all so original that they can come up with a whole word on their own, other than, than so. But that's the stuff that gets, you know, we're all preparing for a, you know, a comet to hit the planet, or global thermonuclear war, or, or whatever they can come up with. But I have this huge list here that I just wanted to put up instead of read to you, and I gotta read it to you. Um, but it's things that I've seen in my lifetime. Forest fires, earthquakes, hurricanes, riots, terrorist attacks, ice storms, moderate pandemics, if you want to call them moderate, blackouts, fuel shortages, tsunamis, nuclear power accidents, flooding, economic recession and depression, coordinated attacks, hazardous material release, droughts, rapid inflation, volcanic activity, warfare, genocide and ethnic cleansing, the lone gunman, and landslides. And I could probably add you know, another three or four dozen to that of things I've actually seen happen. And when I started putting together the show and, uh, and, and, and putting together a program that I wanted people to be able to follow instead of fall out of, I realized that if I was going to do that, if I was going to attract an audience, if I was going to actually be around two, three, four years later like I have been now, uh, today uh, I just checked to make sure I was right. On Friday, t uh, yesterday, I published my 847th episode of the show. And that kind of longevity comes from people taking you there with them. So if you want people to do that for you, you have to give them something they can actually do. You can have actually have to do things that make them feel what they do matters. And you have to put them on a, a something that makes sense so that they don't all get mocked by their uh, brother-in-law. Instead, their brother-in-law goes, hey, you know what? You really do know what you're doing because uh, during the ice storm, we all stayed at your house. And, and that's what I tried to do. That's what I tried to put together. So when I see all this like really sensationalistic stuff, it's not that none of that stuff can ever happen, it's that the possibility is very, very low. So I say we should prepare for what's most likely to happen. I had a guy the other day call in and say, I'm preparing for an economic collapse. I said, great, how'd you do with the one we're having right now? <laughs> and uh, he didn't really like the response to it. You know, he was like, I, I don't know what you mean. Well, we, we just had an economic collapse. Oh, I'm preparing for the real collapse. And you know, we, to be a realist, uh, will the dollar collapse? Yeah, what will it look like? I don't know. Anybody that tells you they know exactly what it's gonna look like is lying to you. When will it happen? I don't know. Anybody that tells you they know exactly when it's going to happen is lying to you, or at least lying to themselves. Because we don't know exactly what it'll look like. We've seen it happen in multiple other countries. I've talked to people that have gone through it, and it's not the same. It's not the same in Greece as it was in the Soviet Union. It's not the same in Greece, and it wasn't the same in the Soviet Union as it was in, is in Argentina today. It's different everywhere. So when I look at what's likely to happen, I say, OK, let's look at something like a tornado. Now, I know you guys don't deal with a lot of tornadoes up here. I used to live in the Northeast. That's one of the things I miss about the Northeast is not you know, watching my news program every day going, not again. Um, but in 2011, we had the biggest tornado outbreak in recorded history. And tornadoes killed 566 people, did $25 billion worth of damage, and injured thousands of others. And that was the worst that it's ever been. By contrast, in 2009, American home values lost about a half a trillion dollars. A half a trillion gone overnight. About six million Americans lost their jobs. That's a disaster for six million families. 
That's what that is. Um, American stockholders, and that's us too, that's not just the super rich, the 1%, lost about $11 trillion in 2009. And 35,000 people killed themselves, according to the CDC. Now, I'm not saying all 35,000 of them killed themselves because, you know, the stock market went down or whatever, but the number the year before was about 29,000, so that was 6,000 more. So I'm going to think those people took it pretty hard. So in all of this, as I was trying to figure out, well, exactly how am I going to put this together in a way that's going to reach people, it's going to make people understand, what can I make my guiding tenant, my tenant number one? And that was everything you do should improve your position in life, even if nothing ever goes wrong. So instead of just buying a pallet full of food, stick it in your garage and being mocked by your family for the rest of your life, and then one day you actually open a can of it and go, God, that sucks. We should, actually, <laughs> we should actually think about doing things that even if nothing goes wrong, they provide a benefit to us and begin our pre preparational planning from there. So we look at things like storing food. And if we eat what we store and store what we eat, instead of storing canned food we don't know how to use, well, you're going to buy that food anyway. Uh, has anybody noticed what way prices on food have gone in the last, I don't know, ever up, right? So if you buy the food today and you eat it two or three months from now, and the things that are storable that you buy that you do that with, you're practicing what's called a capital deferral. It's what makes Southwest Airlines so, uh, so profitable. They buy fuel when it's low. They buy contracts on the fuel. And the rest of the airlines, I guess, can't figure this out. They're too busy groping us. Um, <laughs> and, and they do this. And, and if they can do it, you can do it too. So now food stores goes from being something that's kind of weird to being something that's convenient. Uh, we don't have to run to the store if we need something. We have plenty uh, if there's something that goes wrong, but yet that's just a convenience. It's like having a store right in your own house. And then you're actually saving money by deferring your capital expenditure. Paying off debt is one of my tenets, uh, but I'll bring it up here at the beginning. If you go through an economic recession or depression, the people on TV that tell you that, oh, in that case, having debt's good are nuts. Uh, they're absolutely out of their mind nuts. Uh, Fernando Fairfalf Aguirre, anybody here know him? Guy that's actually lived through an economic collapse in Argentina. Yeah, he said if you had debt uh, when the, uh, the Argentinian uh, economy collapsed, if you were in just the right position, you could use arbitrage against the dollar and you actually benefited. And that was one-tenth of one percent of the people. And his follow-up to that was, but guess what, guys? You don't have the ability to arbitrage against your own dollar. So you're done. You're through if you're in deep debt and we have a, a, a crash. Gold's a good idea, but I'm going to tell you right now, cash is king for a while, too, as, as the inflation takes over. You need to have both. So when you get out of debt, that's good if we have a recession. It's good if you lose your job, right? But it's also good every day. I've had not one person that listens to my show call up and go, Jack, because of you, I got out of debt two years ago. And I am so ticked off at you. You are such a jerk. I mean, that's just never happened to me. Now, I've had a lot of people go, man, I wish I, was, I wasn't in all this debt, but I've never seen it the other way. Installing alternative energy, you know, everybody thinks of the off-grid cabin and what have you. But when you do alternative energy smart and right and you focus on efficiency first, you increase the value of your home. If you sell it, it's more marketable, it's easier to sell. Right now, there's a lot of houses out there sitting. Uh, but you can sell a house. We sold our house in three days when we put it on the market about eight months ago because we made it better than everything else in our class. Um, owning gold and silver. How many here own gold or silver? Great. Do you feel better because you own gold and silver? Has the whole world collapsed yet? No. Do you barter with your gold and silver? See, it, it makes things better for you today, even if we don't have the eventual complete collapse. But if we do, trust me, you're going to be really happy you have it. Or growing, growing a garden. How many people here grow some portion of your own food? Do you feel good when you're gardening? Do you feel good about what you're feeding your family? But do you feel really great that if something goes wrong, you have yet another source of food? So you see how that works. So my guiding tenet is every single thing you do, everything you do, for preparedness should have some positive benefit right now. And the reason I knew that was important is because people do what they benefit from right now today. They don't really strive to do things that are gonna benefit them tomorrow. That's why so many people retire broke. Think about it this way. If you walked into a room and there's a guy laying on the ground and you, and they, you said, well, what happened to him? Well, he didn't exercise or eat right today, so he died. You'd be like, I'm gonna push up and I'm gonna do everything. I'm gonna take care of myself now. But since it takes the guy 30 years of that abuse of his body, then we all have a tendency to do the same thing. So what you see an immediate benefit in, you'll do. So focus on those things first. Uh, tenant number two is debt. I believe that debt is financial cancer. Uh, so I believe you pay it off early and you stay away from credit cards. Don't tell me about your airline miles. I, I don't care about your airline miles. Um, credit cards are just, there's, there's no good that comes from them. Um, and I want to talk real quick to you about the similarities between debt and cancer. We had two guys, let's say one's named Ron and one that was named Tom. 
And Ron gets out of school, whether high school or he goes to college or whatever, and he has debt from student loans. He takes on more debt. He buys a car. He continues to grow his debt. By 35, he actually looks really, really successful, assuming he has a good job. His kids are on all the activities. They have two nice cars. He lives in a better house. Well, Ron over here, right, now he stayed debt-free. So by 35, he looks like he's living in a more modest house. He's driving maybe a beater car, and he's working hard. But by 45, the guy that stays out of debt is really solid in his life. He probably owns his home outright. He owns no man anything. And when you owe somebody money and they hold it over your head, you know what that makes you? A slave. Absolutely. I'm, glad I'm here with enlightened people. You guys know the answer to this, right? It makes you a slave. So the other guy at 45, he's a slave. There are hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. They probably still have the student loan debt. They have that around so long, you might as well name it and call it a pet. <laughs> and, and they're miserable. And what has happened is all through his life, this guy with all the debt has looked healthy and strong, and the debt has been metastasizing and destroying his life from the inside. Tell me if that doesn't sound like every case of cancer when it's caught too late you've ever heard of. That's what debt really is. That's why you got to stay out of it. And I want you to do something else for me. I want you to stop measuring your debt in dollars. The dollar is running away with inflation. It's become meaningless. We hear numbers like $14, $15 trillion. You can't even make sense of it anymore. Your, your cost in debt is measured in years. How many years does it take away from your life? How much does it take away from you? How long do you spend working when you shouldn't, when you could be with your family because you have to pay off that debt? As soon as you look at it that way, you will cast it off and you will never, ever go back. And I want you to realize that you got to ignore BS and lies. When you hear the guy come on the radio and go, learn about special programs that the creditors don't want you to know about. He's full of crap. He's lying to you. And there is no special program. There's one program for paying off your debt and one only. You pay it off. That's it. That's the only one. A special program is you give us the money first. We'll take a little bit of it and then we'll pay it for you and we'll reduce your payment. Folks, that doesn't get you out of debt. That keeps you in debt longer. And I also want to say one more time, no one has ever never written me, called me, emailed me, anything, and said, you jerk, you got me out of debt. Every person I hear from that's gotten out of debt feels like they've decoupled from the matrix, and they feel like they're free for the first time in their lives. And they all say the same thing, I will never go back. Tenant number three, become a producer of food. Growing your own food is for everyone, not just eco-hippies. Right? Remember the garden movement? It was all the hippies were growing food. Um, I want you to understand something. I know I'm here to talk to you about survivalism, and I'm going to talk to you about money. I'm going to talk to you about gold. I'm going to talk to you about guns. I'm going to talk to you about electricity. But you need food more than all of those. Who here has been in a fight every single day of your life from the time you were born until now? One person here. That's, you're a tough lady, man. Um, who here has eaten every day of your life and, 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 you know, from when you were born until now? Yeah, me too. Right? You've got to eat. So producing your own food is, is, is integral to your survival. And holding a neighborhood together or a region together during a disaster is when people still have hope. When you can feed your kids, you have hope. And when your neighbors can feed their kids, you can have hope. And you keep your neighborhood together. When you lose hope, that's when everything breaks down. That's when you end up in a hur Hurricane Katrina situation. When people lose hope, they don't think there's a tomorrow. When people can feed each other, they will. When people can't feed each other, they steal from each other. It's human nature. Well. I mean, I'm all about being prepared for the long term if we have to. But if you call me up and say, come over to my house and help me figure out what to do, how to get out of my house if there's a fire, I'd say, let's, how to, let's figure out how to keep the sucker from burning down first. Right? Doesn't that make sense? Let's, let's make sure you're not like, I don't know, storing lit candles in your cabinet. That would be a bad idea. <laughs> well, when, when, we make, when we take a point where we turn our, our urban and our suburban and even our rural neighborhoods into food deserts, that's what we're doing. We're burning a candle in our cabinet and going, gee, I can't believe the house burned down. Well, numbskull, you should put the candle in there. So it just takes one little interruption in the system to set things off when people go three, four, or five days without being able to feed themselves. And if you have four or five days of food around and you go three days, it's not a big deal. But one day is all it takes. So make sure that food is there and not just stored, but being grown. And you have to grow your own food because storing food is a finite endeavor. I don't care how much money you have, you're still going to run up against a spatial limitation at some point. You can only store so much food. And those, of, those in the survivalist community that think like, well, if somebody from my neighborhood comes to me and tries to get my food, I'll just shoot them. Okay, so you're going to shoot Mrs. Etheridge that lives at the end of the road, that walked you to school when you were a little kid? Really? That's who you are? Because if that's who you are, don't, don't get involved in my community. You'll be out the day things go wrong. See, we have to take care of each other. And I know you guys understand that because you're part of a movement where you do take care of each other. You're part of a movement where when somebody is uh, being harassed, about 14 of you show up with cameras and film what's going on. 
You have to think the same way about survival because that's what it's really all about. And I also want you to realize there's a reason that people say, I have to put food on the table, because you do. It's a cliche because it's true. So we need to focus on our own food production. I also want you to understand that producing your own food is not just about your gardens. It also includes producing storable items. So learning skills that your grandparents knew, like canning, dehydration, and how to, smoking meat, and how to put food away. Uh, one thing I particularly love is called biltong. Anybody that listens to my show probably has heard of it. I see people happy about it back there. Uh, it makes jerky like something you throw away. Uh, it's a South African thing. If you want to know uh, how to make it, get with me later, and I'll give you the recipe. I don't have time to get it in here today. Um, but also, just anything you can do to convert food into a long-term storable is part of being your own producer. So that could mean being involved in a CSA, or going down to a local farmer's market at the end of the harvest time and buying food when it's really, really cheap because they have that whole harvest at the end and they just want to get rid of it. If you can take it home and can it or dehydrate it, then you don't have to pay a company like Mountain House to do that for you, and you can do it for yourself. And you actually know where your food came from because I am a fan of the long-term storable food for the, for the limitation of space and time that we all have to, to extend it. But I'm not for the base of what you do. And I'll tell you what, I have no idea where those people get what they're, what they're putting in those cans. And they're not going to tell us because they get it wherever they can get it. And that's the answer. So they, they don't even know because this week's going to be different than next week. But when you go down to your farmer's market and buy 40 pounds of green beans and dehydrate them, uh, and it won't take that much space up after you dehydrate them, you know exactly where they came from and who grew them. And if there ever is a crisis with food, uh, who do you think that producer is going to want to sell to first? The guy that supported them the whole time or some clown that just shows up going, dude, I'm hungry, sell me something. So make sure you have relationships with your local producers of food as well. Uh, tenant number four. I think you guys are going to like this one. Tax is theft. The best way to combat it is to understand every legal deduction you can take or create. And on taxation, I think that people don't really understand how it reduces self-sufficiency and independence. There's two ways. The first way is really easy to see. If I take your money and you don't have it, you have less money to be self-sufficient with and you have less that you can advance your life with. But as the state, if I'm a robber and I take your money, well, then I go away and I don't bother you anymore, right? But if I'm the state, I take your money and I use it to infringe further upon your liberty. And then you make more money and I take more of your money and I further infringe upon your liberty. So taxation is a two-edged sword because it's not just the money you don't have. It's your own money then being used against you. If you think about it, it's kind of like martial arts. A good martial artist can actually redirect the attack of his, his opponent and redirect it onto them. Well, the government's a good martial artist because 10 dudes are standing around with guns going, let this guy punch you in the face or we're going to shoot you. And that's the, that's the threat of taxation. So um, I'm not going to be one of these people to tell you the income tax is unconstitutional and you don't have to pay it. Actually, I'll tell you the first part, but the second part about not having to pay it, no. Um, you end up in jail if you do that or prison. And to me, I can't fight for liberty when I'm locked in a cell. Very, very difficult to do anyway. Um, I don't think they'd let me do my show every day if I was in, in prison. Um, so I want to stay out of prison. So what I do is I use good accounting practices. I know that sounds mundane, but it works. I buy used items whenever I can uh, from private parties, individual barter. Um, I do a lot of barter and trade. I try to avoid sin taxes. So uh, we've got a bottle of mead one of uh, my listeners brought to me over there. So there's no tax when you make your own mead or wine or beer. Uh, those of you who smoke, and I really don't think you should, but if you want to, hey, you know what? We built this country on tobacco and cotton. It's one of the best places in the world to grow tobacco. Why are you giving the government your money for your tobacco? Grow your own. It's really easy. It actually is very easy to do. Um, and reduce your income at some point. At some point, you say to yourself, I've got enough. And I know a lot of people aren't there yet, but when you do, you can reduce your money and give that money to charity. Um, I don't trust my government. How many people here do? How many people here trust themselves? Okay, so if you're going to give money to somebody by gunpoint or by choice, I would trust myself to make a better choice. And charities don't always have to be tax-deductible charities. They can also be just good things that you do, good karma. I'm going to give you a little bit more on that at the end. Tenant number five, food stored is an exceptional investment. You simply can't lose by storing food that you're going to eventually buy anyway. Um, does anybody remember the years of 2007 to 2008? Whose 401k plan had an 11% return for both of those years? Positive return. <laughs> he did. He must be a trader then instead of a, uh, somebody that just sat on it. Um, well, 
According to an article that was run by the LA Times in 2009, from 2007 to 2008, both years had an average 11% ROI on commonly available and storable food. Your money was better off in your pantry than in your 401k. Unless you're a smart guy like this dude here, it's probably a game in the market, pretty cool. Yeah, maybe you should be my investment advisor, because if you pull that off. Were you in hedge funds or? Okay, see, so yeah, there you go. Okay, gotcha, cool. So. To me, if we're going to store food, we've got to do it common sense so we don't end up with that garage full of god-awful MREs. Who remembers from the 1990s the number four MRE? Anybody here served the, the omelet with spam? Wasn't that? Yeah, it was gross, wasn't it? Yeah, it was number two was the omelet with ham, but four was the, the, the ham slice. That thing was, ugh. So you don't want a garage full of, you know, 1990 ham slices. Um, so what do you do? The first thing you do is you eat what you store and store what you eat. So the things that you eat every day, people say, well, what should I buy for food storage? First thing I'll tell you to do, get a notebook, put it on your countertop. Every time you eat anything for the next two or three weeks, write down what you ate. One thing you'll find yourself, like I did, is getting skinnier. <laughs> because you'll go, man, I really don't need to eat that, do I? But the other thing you'll do is you'll make your shopping list. You'll, you'll actually buy the things you actually eat. If there's a crisis and your kids like Kraft macaroni and cheese, I don't. But if that's what your kids like, you better have some of it around. Because it'll keep them calm and placid and feel like they get the things that they've, uh, they've expected. And let's face it, we can make Kraft macaroni and cheese as long as we can get fire, water, and boiling water in a pot. It doesn't matter if it's on a grill. It doesn't matter if it's in the backyard in a little stove that we fabricate. It doesn't matter how we do it. As long as we can boil water, we can make the kids Kraft mac and cheese. So whatever you eat is what you should be storing. And just keep it in rotation. That's what the stores do, right? Um, take advantage of opportunity buys. What will happen is when you get up to about 30, 60 days of food, you'll go to the store and go, man, they usually put this stuff on sale, but it's not on sale this week. So what do you do that week since you have like four weeks worth of it at home? Don't buy it. And then they put something on sale that you use all the time, and that week you put your money there. You start making decisions the way corporations do for your family. Because if you don't, corporations will make their decisions with no consideration of your family. That's how it works. If you want to, to run your household, instead of whining about the corporation, learn from the corporation. Emulate the corporation. And if you want to be a corporation, you can file a piece of paper and do it in a few minutes. Um, I also believe in the long-term commercial storage. I've kind of bashed it up till now. I don't want you to think that I have no place for it in my life. But it should be once you get that 60 to 90 days and you start wanting to maybe have six months worth of food storage, which I think is a good goal for people, because it also lets you in a short-term disaster feed your neighbors. It's easier to feed your neighbors than shoot them. Uh, there's less uh, legal repercussions for that, and uh, it's easier to live with yourself after doing that. Um, so I think going to six months is six months for your family, but it might be two months for your community, and it might fall on you to do that. And, and you have to think that way, because without your community, you're done. Because if, if, if you don't take care of them, they're not going to take care of you. And eventually in these situations, we know order breaks down. So we use these long-term storage foods, like Mountain House, like providing pantry, to extend ourselves beyond what we can do with, with just keeping a deep pantry. Again, become a producer, so grow your own food, learn to store your own food. And the big thing is seek a holistic solution. Um, don't look for a single magic bullet. That's what people get into trouble with. That's what makes people feel like, boy, that was stupid. That, you know, Y2K is a perfect example. Um, all of the companies that I talk to that sell into the emergency disaster preparedness say, Y2K was great. People bought so much stuff. And I'm like, what was 2001 like for you? And most of them barely made it through that year still in business because they weren't taking care of their customers. They weren't helping their customers make rational decisions. They weren't teaching their customers to have a life of preparedness. They were working on alarmism. And, and that's where people get into trouble with the commercial long-term storage food. They freak out one day, they whip out the Amex card, and they buy $20,000 worth of canned food. And then they go, this stuff sucks. I don't even want to eat it if there is a disaster. So when you're doing your long-term storage food, open the stuff up once in a while and use it. I can tell you some good stuff to, to, to start out with for some long-term protein. Uh, Mountain House does a uh, freeze-dried uh, pork chop. If you rehydrate and cook those on the grill, you'd think they came from the grocery store yesterday. Um, but I'm not telling you to go buy a, a pallet of them, right? Um, but learn how to use this stuff. Make it part of your cooking as well if you're doing this long-term storage solution. Um, the next one, tenant number six, pre prepare for disaster based on a most likely threat you face as an individual. By the time you prepare for the most likely disasters, you will be well prepared for just about anything. I'm going to give you a couple scenarios. You guys tell me which one you think is more likely to happen. One person loses a job or a complete and total economic collapse. 
Okay. Localized riots or a global pandemic with a 10% death rate. I mean, the global pandemic is possible, but I've seen a lot of riots in my life. Uh, an earthquake or a global nuclear war. Anybody see global nuclear war ever not on TV? Okay. Anybody ever see an earthquake even including on TV? Yeah, okay. Uh, a trucker strike or a brand new ice age that puts the, the uh, polar caps back to the equator. <laughs> All right, so, so what does that tell us? That tells us that disasters have an inverse relationship. The greater the impact of the disaster on a global scale, the smaller the likelihood of it occurring. They call that a high, a high impact, low probability event. NASA uses that term when they talk about meteor strikes or asteroid strikes or comet strikes. So there's an order of probability of disaster, and that order of probability is actually pretty simple. Look at yourself right now. Touch yourself, right? You're the individual. That's the most likely form of disaster you'll ever face. Losing a job, losing a spouse, having a tree fall on your house, having your house burned down. I've had listeners on the show talk about what it's like to go through a fire. You wouldn't believe what happens. Uh, one listener, the people that came to board his house up and uh, so that the stuff was in there that, would, that was still good would be secure, while they were boarding his house up, they stole everything he had left that was worth a damn, and they got away scot-free. So that's an individual disaster. And how do you be prepared for that? If your house ever burns down, when somebody's there boarding your house, if you don't leave till they're done. Okay, and I, I mean, I hate to put it that way. Think about that. Well, a man's that far down, the people that came to help him stole from him. And they absolutely know what happened, but there's no way to prove it. So then the next is a local disaster. Local disaster could be anything from your neighborhood to maybe your town. And there's, if we look at things like the hurricane outbreaks lately, you know, cut Joplin, Missouri in half. That would be a local disaster. Small region, so a small region's bigger than just a town or a city or county. That would be something like Hurricane Katrina. Uh, we heard 24-7, New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans. It really ticked off a lot of people in Alabama and Mississippi that that happened. It really did, because they went through just as much misery. They didn't have the civil breakdown, but they went through a tremendous amount of misery. Uh, it also ticked a lot of people in East Texas off, because Rita came in uh, much closer to Beaumont, Texas, uh, right after uh, Katrina. So even though the media told us that, that was a regional disaster. A large region would be when we get into something that we probably haven't really experienced recently, uh, but for a lot of places that have actually been an active war zone, that would be a large regional disaster. Uh, a national disaster could also be a large, uh, a large war zone. It could be an epidemic, a pandemic, and then global. But the order that those go are an exact inverse relationship of the most, likelihood that, uh, most likely you'll have to deal with. Most likely what you're going to have to deal with is going to involve you, maybe your family, maybe your neighbors. So we prepare for that first. Now here's the interesting thing. By the time you get to where you can stand through a disaster, assuming you're not taken out when it initially occurs, that's in something the size of your county, you're just about as well prepared as the average person with the average budget can ever be prepared for the most global thing ever, and you're actually pretty well prepared for it. Because the most important thing that you do as you start to go through this process is you pre prepare yourself mentally. There's people that have died in the middle of disasters that had everything they needed to save themselves, but they were so panicked they couldn't think about what to do. When you start actually actively doing these steps, you begin to mentally prepare yourself. You start running mental scenarios. And when something goes wrong, you know what to do. It was really cool. Right after I like, really started pushing this stuff at home, and you know, it was kind of tough at first. Um, but we had one day where the power just went out. And um, you know, it wasn't a really big deal. I was just like, oh, the power went out. Let's go do something. It was cool because like, my kid ran and grabbed some firewood. We had a fire going. My wife ran and grabbed some flashlights and batteries. It was just a little thing. But no one had to tell anybody what to do. Everybody just did it. And that's the level of preparedness you want to get to. When something goes wrong, your family has to be acting like a team. If you're a team of one, because you live alone, so be it. But if you have a family, bring them in on it. Uh, make it fun for kids. It really can be fun for kids. I remember I was such a, I was such a retarded kid. I really was. Um, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, we used to had all the hurricanes you know, that were out there in the Gulf at the time. And, uh, and uh, they, the, like Rite Aid and the drugstores would give away these maps, and you could track your hurricanes. And I would track the hurricanes and hope one came so I could see what it was like. <laughs> you know? And that's how kids are. And don't quash that, right? Because that, that is a self-defense mechanism for children. That allows them to deal with these crises. So they need to feel that you're also dealing with the crises, and then they don't panic, and then they do what mom and dad says. So they can be valuable members of the team, even when they're very young, as long as you talk to them honestly, but don't make it scary. Make it, this is what we do if this happens. Kids are remarkably resilient uh, if you treat them like what they are, small people, uh, not toys. All right? um, tenant number seven. This is one of my favorite ones. Alternative energy is for creating independence, not for saving polar bears. I am not trying to save the polar bear by conserving water in my house or putting a solar panel on my roof. 
I'm trying to create something for myself called systemic independence. I want to know that if the grid goes down, even if I use it day to day, I can get by until it comes back. Whether it's a week, a month, or a year, I want to know I can get by. I want to know that I have enough energy production capacity not to be completely happy and have my air conditioner set to 68, which is where I like it, and where I will keep it, thank you, Barack Obama. <laughs> if you don't like your house at 68, you can turn it to any temperature you want, but in the, in the summertime, my house is at 68 degrees. I'll pay to be comfortable. But I want to be able to do the essentials on my own because that's what's really important. I don't have to have enough alternative energy to be able to do that. It's, it's almost impossible for an individual to do that unless you live somewhere where it, it is 68 degrees. Um, so I believe the first thing we do with alternative energy is we don't even worry about the product. We look at efficiency. Things like radiant barriers, boring stuff like insulation. Because then when we go ahead and we start putting these alternative energy solutions and we get more bang for our buck out of them, and instantly we start cutting our expense and we can use that money to further our self-sufficiency. See how it works. So after you do that, then you might want to do something next, like build a simple backup power system. It's an inverter, maybe a couple batteries, and, and a charger you plug into your wall. And then you have enough power to, to give yourself basic conveniences for a few hours to a few days after the grid goes down. So your simple blackouts then become kind of like a really cool camping trip in the living room. Um, after that, maybe you acquire a small generator set. And you do the backup power system first because it's easier, it costs less money, it doesn't make any noise, and it doesn't need any fuel, and it's always being recharged when you keep it on trickle charge. When you bring the small generator set in, you can run the generator to run appliances and different things in your home, and at the same time, you can be charging your backup power system. Now, if things are going on that are kind of nefarious at night and things are getting kind of scary at night, you don't want the generator sitting there going, bah, right? Because that, like, says, hello, we're here. Right? So you don't want that running. So you can charge your backup power system with your generator during the day and bring it in-house at the night and use it for simple lighting and things like that without giving away your position. It's really, really simple. Uh, once you do that, then maybe you want to look at solar or wind or some other form of alternative energy, and you tie that into your backup system first. So this is small-scale stuff. This is maybe 60, 120 watts of solar panels onto your backup system. The reason you do that, you just built a scale model of what one looks like for your house. So now you can take one of the biggest expenses out of solar energy, which is the installation cost, because you've just taught yourself how to do it for yourself, because it really is that simple. And maybe you need an electrician to come in and do some of the final wiring in, but you've just taught yourself how to assemble uh, and figure out everything you need to do to build the system. At that point, maybe you want to add a more powerful generator, maybe a whole house backup generator, and then considering adding a large-scale solar wind or some type of combination system. And wind is not the answer for everybody. Uh, when I was living in North Texas, I thought, when we moved to our, our, our homestead up in Arkansas, I'm going to put in a windmill. And then I moved there in the summer, and the wind chimes didn't even make any noise. <laughs> I'm like, that's not really a good idea. So make sure when you're planning things like that into your life, you think about how they actually are going to play out for you and how they'll actually work for you. Tenant number eight. Owning land is true wealth. Owning productive land is the primary means of creating systemic independence. Um, I believe that the main reason people came to this country, especially prior to 1900, wasn't because we had a cool flag or a cool constitution. And the main reason we came here even before there was a constitution or a declaration of independence is the same reason they were coming then. You could own land in this country. And up until very recently, and still today in many countries, the individual citizen does not have the right to own land as their own personal property. But here you could own it. Here it could be yours. In the colonial times, when people were first coming here, it was one of the only places you could do that as an individual. If you were still back, there was a feudal system, guys. If you were a farmer, you farmed, and you gave away certain amounts of your production to the lord or the king or the duke, and you got whatever was left over. Well, you could come here and you could own land, you could produce, and you could keep it all. Of course, then they introduced taxation and kind of screwed that up. But the spirit's still there. And what you produce and eat, you don't pay taxes on. Not yet, anyway. They haven't come up with a tomato tax. They, they, they probably will sometime, but I should have said that. I probably just gave them an idea. They're probably, because they're watching me, you know that. <laughs> um, so I believe that what we should all do is what our forefathers did. They did not have houses. They didn't even have homes. They had homesteads. That's how they looked at it. It wasn't just the house. It was the land and everything that it gave to them. You, as a, when you look at survival from like teaching in a wilderness standpoint, you've got food, you've got shelter, you've got water, uh, you've got fire, and you've got security. Those are the five things you have to worry about. Whether it's in an urban situation, you don't want to get mugged, or you're in the wilderness, you don't want to get eaten by a bear. So there's a security component. Fire, in modern terms, would be thinking, thinking more along the lines of energy. 
So we want fire in the wilderness so we can create heat, light, and cook. And we use energy of some form to do that. It might be fire or it might be electricity in our homes today. But those are the five survival needs that you have. A proper homestead addresses those five needs. Shelter is pretty obvious. You've got a roof and walls. But it's not yours until you own it. So the first thing you do is you pay off your mortgage as fast as reasonably possible. And when some financial advisor goes, John, let me tell you, if you just wait until 30 years, you'll get the preach. No, right? Because I'll tell you what, right now, if somebody paid off his house for him, he wouldn't say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a mortgage on it and, and go back into debt. He'd leave it paid off. He just doesn't want you to pay off your mortgage because then you're not putting your money into the investments he recommends. And he doesn't get paid when you pay off your mortgage. So pay off your mortgage as quick as you can. Improve your energy efficiency and independence. Move away from large urban areas. Uh, that's a personal choice, though. It, it's up to you. I just think there's tremendous advantage, at least into getting into kind of the outer suburbs to the, the rural areas. I think it gives you a lot more freedom. Uh, you're left alone a lot more. A lot of things that I want to do, if I did them in a suburban area, I'd have neighbors calling code enforcement officials on me. You know, he's got a big, giant garden bed in his front yard. Yeah, I want to grow food in it. You can't grow food in your front. You know, I mean, we've heard these stories. So the more rural you get, and I mean, ideal for me would be about 40 acres instead of the five I have now. And I would have about 20 acres in a belt of trees around it where you can't even see what's going on in there. Just because so, people don't see things, they don't complain about it. So it's not to be secretive. I just want to be left alone. So that's why I think that's a big piece of that. Um, it also, it, 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 who here has heard of permaculture? Excellent. You guys probably listen to my show. Um, those of you who haven't, you want to you write that word down, permaculture. It's how, to, it's how to create a completely sustainable culture, and it really focuses heavily on agricultural components. And there's ways to grow your food in perpetual systems that continue to produce. And the cool thing is, I get this one a lot, Jack, I don't want a garden, because when, when, when the zombies come out, uh, having a garden is going to let people know that you're there, and they're going to come take your tomatoes or, or whatever. Um, when you do permaculture, right, it doesn't look like a garden. It looks like a little forest in your backyard, but there's food everywhere. And the, the plants support each other. I can't go deeper into it today than that because I could stand up here for eight hours and talk about permaculture techniques. Uh, but if you go to my show and search for permaculture, you'll find plenty of information on it. Uh, utilize small livestock. So I believe that it makes things to do things like uh, bring chickens into the equation. Start, I mean, eggs are you know, going up and up in price, and they're really garbage. Everybody I've talked to out there, who keeps chickens and eats their eggs? Right? Awesome. How many of you really enjoy it when you go eat an egg from like a restaurant now? It's just like, oh my God. How many people keep chickens and have, have slaughtered and, and eaten their own chickens they grow? Does it taste like chicken you get from the supermarket? Does chicken from the supermarket taste good anymore? It's like a cardboard box. Okay, there you go. Um, so it's also, it's, it's a sustainable source of food and protein, but it's also, it it's, goes back into the permaculture thing. If people that, I have fruit flies and my fruit trees won't produce well. If you had chickens under there breaking that cycle, that wouldn't happen. So there's multiple things that it does. Look into things like aquaponics, systems that can produce both po protein and plant life for you. Um, put a greenhouse in, especially up here. I mean, I, can, I, I have broccoli growing right through February. We had ice on it, and it survived. But I, and I think you guys could have got away with it this year, but I don't think most New Hampshire winters you could be out gardening it. Um, but a greenhouse extends that for you, allows you to keep producing food. 12 months out of the year, you can produce food with a greenhouse, even here in New Hampshire. And realize this, for those that have the big homestead dream or what have you, an acre may be more than enough. You'd be amazed what you can do with an acre. Um, there's a DVD from a guy named Jeff Lawton, spelled Jeff with a G, out of Australia. And it's called Urban Permaculture. And I think it costs like 35 bucks because the shipping's insane because it's only available out of Australia. And uh, they have all those eco laws about how it's packaged, even though they're sending it here. Um, but anyway, it's worth, it's worth the 35 bucks. And you'll see what people do on an eighth of an acre lot or a fifth of an acre lot. And it's unbelievable. And it makes you start to realize, if I really utilize 100% of what I have, what can I do with an acre or two or three? So don't think you have to wait till one day when you can settle on that 80 acres I talked about. You can do it right where you're at, even on a small urban lot. Tenant number nine, it's the boring one for a lot of people. Do not ignore pragmatic preparations such as insurance, emergency cash funds, and long-term investing. Uh, life property insurance to meet your asset replacement value. So at least insure the stuff you have so you can replace it if it's stolen or blown up or burned down or what have you. Um, include real commodities in your investments. So I mean gold and silver, absolutely, 5%, 10% of your net worth. Uh, but I also mean when you look at your net worth, if you've bought a tractor for your homestead, it's going to last 100 years. 
because there's some of them out there that are almost that old today when they're built right. That's a lifelong asset. That provides a lot of utility for you and a lot of advantages for you. Your gun is an asset. The ammunition that goes in, it's an asset. It can defend your family, it can protect your home, and it can put food on the table. So it's an asset. So start understanding that some of your investments are about the things that you buy for the rest of your life, which will lead you to something I always say. Always be frugal, never be cheap. Never be cheap. Cheap always sucks. Cheap is the guy that buys the $8 garden hose. He buys one every year. It's not cheap. You know, it really isn't. It always costs more in the long run. Buy the best you can afford. Really good quality, lifelong investments are only expensive once. That's important to understand. Um, don't put 100% of your savings into retirement accounts. Again, the reason that your financial advisor says, you know, they, they pay lip service. You need a 90-day emergency fund. But let's start investing your 15% right now, even though you don't have it, right? And even though you're in debt. It, as long as you put it into a retirement account, it becomes somewhat captive. It's much more difficult to make it liquid. And that means it stays in some sort of account that he gets paid on. So, gee, why would he tell you to do that? Now, Understand this, he's probably not a bad guy. He's doing what he was trained to do. But the people training him and the people setting up those training programs, they know precisely what they're doing. They want your money held captive. How many people could have used some money uh, over the last five years and had some money that it would have been really expensive to get to so they didn't take it? Yeah? Quite a few people. So when you're putting money away for your long-term retirement, I believe in 401ks or IRAs and what have you, but don't put 100% of the money you're saving for your retirement there. You just might need it sooner. It's also the most regulated money in the world. Everybody's, everybody knows how much is there. Everybody's eyeballs are on it. Um, I am not a fan of like silver and gold and IRAs. Silver and gold are the most liquid, uh, anonymous forms of currency known to man. So then people do what? They put them into a highly regulated form of, of uh, financial uh, vehicle. Well, that's great. So you've just taken the, the biggest value that these things have, being portable and anonymous, and you've ruined it by saying to the government, here's all my silver and gold. So don't do that. So keep those types of investments out of there. But make sure you keep some cash as part of your investments. Uh, and I mean some cash like in a bank account. I mean some cash like in a safe deposit box. I mean some cash maybe in a strong box or buried in your backyard or wherever you feel comfortable with it, but not in one place. Uh, banks fail. It's happened before. Uh, sometimes assets in banks get frozen. Uh, sometimes you can't get to the bank even just for a weekend when you really need money. So make sure there's some money around too. This is a very important one. I want you to listen very carefully, especially young parents uh, that have young children or thinking about your children's futures. I want you to save money for your child's future. I want you to punch any financial advisor that uses the word 529A fund in the face when he tells you that. I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what your belief is about college. I don't care what your belief in your kid is. When your kid is six years old, you do not know that at 18, 19, 20 years old, that kid's going to be cut out for college. He really might not be. You, you can get a loan to send your kids to school, but I still want you to save money for your kids. But I believe you save money for your kids. I don't care what you do as long as you keep it liquid. And I call it a life establishment fund. Your kid might be the next Mark Zuckerberg. And he might have the next multi-million dollar idea. You don't know. He might be somebody that just wants to be happy. I just met a young guy, 22 years old, did my haircut for me. I think he did an okay job. You know, and he's, he's working 14 hours a day right now while his friends are working for minimum wage, building his own business. And uh, he said he had to do, I don't remember what it was, but he had a partner going in on this with him that skipped out. And he was $2,900 in the hole on day one. And he worked so hard for the first three weeks, he pulled himself out of that hole. That's the kind of kid I want to give a life establishment fund to, not a 529A plan. And you don't know what your kids are going to want to do, and you don't know what your kids are going to want to be. And this lie that everybody should go to college is stupid. How many people went to college and sitting next to you was someone, at least someone you knew, this guy doesn't need to be here? Right? OK. Right? And that guy is in the way of people that do need to be there. I'm not a dumb guy. I, I, I seem to work things out pretty well, but I didn't go to college because it would have bored the heck out of me. It just wasn't right for me. So you don't know what that's going to be. And that doesn't mean that somebody that doesn't go to, to college is you know, not going to be successful. I don't think Henry Ford went to college. Uh, Peter Schiff was talking last night. Some of the wealthiest people in the creation of this country never even got out of high school. Now, I do think you should make sure your kids are educated, but be a self-directed learner. Next one, uh, have a will and keep it updated. I'm back to the other question I asked you. How many people trust the government here? <laughs> OK. If you don't have a will, you're trusting the government to do the right thing with your money when you die. I'll leave it at that. 
Tenant number 10, have a means of defense, acquire the knowledge and training to use it effectively. First of all, I want to tell you, I'm a huge supporter of the Second Amendment. I imagine I'm surrounded by people that are as well. I see lots of open carry people and stuff like that. Um, does anybody remember when you were in grade school, they would say things like, Johnny, when you turn 18, you need to register to vote. Because if you don't exercise your, register, your, your right to vote, somebody might take it away from you. So part of self-defense is if we don't exercise rights, they're removed. You want to ensure the Second Amendment, you can argue with your liberal neighbor all you want about why we should all have the right to own weapons. Or you can take them to the gun range and teach them there's nothing to be afraid of and give them the power that under, is understood when you can defend your family and you'll convert more people that way. The best way we can preserve our right to keep and bear arms in this country is to keep and bear arms and teach other people to do it as well. I also want to speak to, uh, I probably don't have to say this here, but I'm going to do it anyway, especially but some of the, some of the women. Uh, this is something I tell my wife all the time, not everybody is your friend. You need to have situational awareness. You need to realize that just because somebody smiles or is nice doesn't mean they don't mean you harm. I love my wife. I really do. But whenever we look at a new car, she's always like, well, I feel bad that we might not buy from him because he was so nice to us. <laughs> Honey, he was paid to be nice to us. So you take that same mentality when you're dealing with people. Trust but verify, I think, was one of the few and really, really spot on things Reagan ever said. Um, trust people but verify their intentions. Uh, that's very important because carrying a gun does you no good if somebody hits you in the back of the head with a baseball bat before you draw it. Uh, and there are people out there that will take just that approach. They'll wait till you're weak. So keep your situation as high. I do think everybody should own weapons. I think the first thing you should do if you did not grow up, fortunately, like you know I did and many other people here probably did, with a family that, that understood weapons and, and trained and taught you to hunt and taught you to use them right, uh, if you've never owned a gun, go get training before you buy a gun. Don't become a statistic that helps the other side. Uh, go find a mentor at least and get some proper training. And I believe everybody should take professional. Sorry to interrupt, Jack. We, in the, the organization here, we have a club called Wilson Air Pistol Club. And we teach all the beginner classes and advanced courses. Awesome, and awesome. That's Wilson Hills Pistol Club? Wilson, Wilson Hill Pistol Club. There you go, guys. Yes? And Wilson Hill has at least three of their instructors in the room, including myself. Awesome. That rocks. Three female instructors. Questions at the end. Questions at the end, please. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Uh, but kind of like if you don't own guns or you're trying to like complete like a battery of arms, what, is, what do I recommend? I recommend a good shotgun, a good 22 rifle, a good center fire rifle, and a good personal defense handgun. And then you have those four, and you learn to use them well. And people that have that, they email me all the time and go, I'm thinking about getting another gun. What do you think I should get? Oh, it's this or that. And I go, when's the last time you took a firearms training class? I don't mean a safety class. I mean professional training on the effectiveness of a firearm. And they usually say, uh, never or a long time ago. Well, take another training class before you buy your next gun. Invest in yourself, as one of our founders, Ben Franklin, would have taught you. The skill set is so important. I'll tell you that the, the top schools that teach this stuff, their own cadre go to other schools every single year to continue to improve their training. I got a guy nodding his head that knows what he's talking about right here. All right. Uh, I also want you to realize you should carry non-lethal defense as well. I carry everywhere I go, I carry pepper spray. Um, this is something you'll have no problem actually taking on an air to airplane as long as it goes in your check baggage. They'll inspect your bag, but they'll, they're supposed to leave it in there. They always leave it in there for me. Um, but if you're going to carry a weapon capable of taking somebody's life, it's incumbent upon you to only use it as a last resort, not a first response. I've heard a lot about the abuse of law enforcement out there today and how they should behave differently. And as citizens carrying, we need to behave the way we would expect the officers to behave, even if they don't, plain and simple. And I'm not putting law enforcement down because there's good guys that do that job, but we all know there's bad guys too. And we're real hip to complain about what they do and how they're abusive with their power. When you put a gun on your hip, you put a gun under your bed, when you put a gun in your nightstand, you're giving yourself the same power, the power to take a life. And it can come down to really simple things. We were walking one time, we have a neighbor with a pit bull dog, and uh, she came right up to us. I had a 9 millimeter on me, and I had it in one hand, and I had pepper spray in the other. And I was able to back the dog off with just a little shot to the ground. And it was a much, you know, much easier conversation would be, dude, um, your dog came at us, and I sprayed it, instead of, dude, here's your dog. <laughs> right? So it could be something that simple, or it can be something far more serious. And only you can make a determination what the right use of force is. And that's our right as citizens in our own defense. And if people don't like that, then they need to leave us alone. But it's also incumbent upon us Every right has a concurrent responsibility. And with your right to self-defense becomes your responsibility to use it justly. 
and where it's most and where, where where it's right to do so, and at the level that's sufficient, you know, um, to make sure that you 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 do go home tomorrow. The first rule of survival: wake up in the morning. Um, next one, tenant number eleven. Build a disaster documentation package and keep multiple copies for all family members to use. Um, you hear a lot about the rules of threes in wilderness survival, three, three, three minutes without air, you know, three, hour, three days without water, three weeks without food, that type of thing. Um, I have a rule of threes with, that, uh, with evacuation. Three destinations that you would go to. Now, there's probably one you really want to go to, like family, friends, or a, what we call a bug out location, a place you actually own, uh, but you may not be able to get there for some reason. And then for each destination of where you would go to, three routes to get there and three rally points along each, each route with a method of communication to your significant other, your, your, your other family members, I've already been here, I had to go on without you. So you come up with some type of a marker, some type of thing that, so you have to understand, you guys might be at work, one's at work, one's at school, and you gotta go and you don't have time to go home first. And you might stop at a, a rest stop that you've made one of your rally points. And in a real civil breakdown, you might have law enforcement come along and go, we're not gonna impede you, but you gotta go, you can't stay here. So then dad or mom comes along later, communication systems are down, do I wait or do I head on? Well, if something's left behind that's already agreed upon to be left behind, you know, she's already been here, he's already been here, I'm gonna go on and meet at the next rally point. If you don't have that plan in advance, what are you gonna do? Your cell phone doesn't always work. Anybody here remember 9-11 and how the cell phones worked? Yes? Of course, absolutely, you know? So, it, it makes sense to have methods of communication, even beyond ham radio. I mean, do you have time to be setting your gear up, right? Does your, does your wife know how to do it too? So having these nonverbal means of communication that just simply say, I was here, come on, I'll, I'll meet you at the next place. Very, very important. Uh, in that documentation package, everyone you could ever need to contact and all contact information, all key ca account information, personal identification numbers, people freak out about that. Somebody's gonna get my bank account number. Here's what you do, you have a simple encryption that you use and everybody in your family knows it, like a positive two or negative two encryption, which would mean if the number was one, two, three, it becomes three, four, five, if it's a positive two encryption. And then most bank account numbers, if you put a one in front of them and then a dash and a zero at the end of them, it looks like Bank of America's phone number instead of your bank account. And you couple that with your encryption. And guys, this is at NASA trying to figure out. It's some identity theft bug. And uh, it's not like a password they can keep just trying, right? So they gotta get it right the first time or they create problems for themselves. So those are simple ways that you can do this. If you keep it with a data, like some type of a data stick or something, obviously you can use things like TrueCrypt to keep that data secure, but you can't always fire up a computer to get that information. So that's why I like it printed out. Um, you also wanna do uh, contact information for all service providers, merchants, support organizations you might need in a disaster, uh, if you've gone somewhere else or even if you've stayed home, and a minimum of three identical copies, one for the house, one for each vehicle. Do it on your computer, uh, and that way when you make a change, you can just update the pages that you've made updates to, and everybody has the same thing. In there should be your maps with your destinations, your routes of evacuation, and what have you. And the reason you want identical copies is when you got your 17-year-old your daughter that's freaking out on the phone talking to you because she has to meet you somewhere and she doesn't know what to do, it's a very calming thing to say, turn to page five, look at map A. There's where you're gonna go. I'll be waiting there for you. It gives a sense of control. People that are scared in a disaster want a leader, and leaders need to appear to have control even when we don't. Uh, it's something they teach you in the military. Always look like you're in control even if you're scared, so your men will follow you. And that's part of your job as a, as a head of the family. Um, then, uh, it, that pretty much wraps that one up. The last one, the most important one, tenant number 12. Develop and implement your own personal plan that you have full ownership of. Um, it's very, very important that you realize that if you disagree with any of the things I said today and you think you should do something else, that's exactly what you should do. I can't give you my plan. That's why I give you a philosophy instead of a plan. If I say step one, step two, step three, step four, you'll follow it right up until you don't agree with it and you'll find an excuse to stop. So what you do is the most important thing and how you think is more important than what you possess. The knowledge between your ears, folks, is what keeps you alive. Not all the stuff stored in your house. And I want you to understand that because of what I just said, my plan cannot, will not, and won't work for you. The only thing that's gonna work for you is your belief that what you do matters. I've talked to oncologists, I've talked to uh, many doctors that deal with terminal illnesses to verify this. But two patients that have the same problem, the one that's a pain in the butt, 
The one that wants to know why they're doing everything, even when they follow the same course of treatment, is the one more likely to survive because they know what they do matters. Now I'm going to reveal something to you guys. I'm not really teaching people modern survival. What I actually have is a big evil secret. My job is to teach people to become personal libertarians. That's what I'm really doing. That's what I'm really all about. When you teach somebody to feed themselves, protect themselves, take care of themselves, take care of their family, the most die-hard statist becomes a libertarian. Because all of a sudden, all of a sudden when they say, well, if... All of a sudden, if, if they say, well, we'll have to cut this program or that program, I don't really care. So I'm going to give you real quick. I know I have to wrap here. I can tell. Um, I have 10 steps here for personal libertarian living. And if you want the extra four, you can go to episode 680 of the show uh, to, to get those. Number one, spread your belief with example, not force. Number two, create independence from the systems. Notice the S. It is not the system. It is the systems. Two, uh, three, solve your own problems whenever you can. Call authorities of last resort. Work things out. Don't call the, the police on your neighbor. Go solve your problem with your neighbor. And you only bring in authority when you can't do it for yourself. Vote for what you believe in, not who you think can win. People say, I don't want to waste my vote. I count about 110 million wasted votes in every general election in this country today. Know why you believe what you believe. You can believe the complete opposite of me, but please know why you believe that. Create your own systems in your own networks, just like you folks are doing here. Let no man speak for you or put words in your mouth. Value education and be a self-directed learner. Argue the ideas, not the validity of the individual you're arguing with. And remember, no matter what anyone says, what you do matters. And keep fighting. Keep fighting every single day. Um, I want you guys to know something. I'm, I'm going to do something here uh, that I promised I would do as I started my show. I said as I became more and more successful, I would start giving back more and more to people. And uh, I sell advertising on my site for about $3,500 a year. We have uh, over 35,000 listeners now. And I have a, a sponsor coming up for renewal. That sponsor does nothing for my community other than pay by check and say, please keep my banner up and give me a weekly so show mention. So I'm not renewing uh, their contract. They didn't do anything wrong. They just didn't do a lot right. So I'm giving that space to the Free State Project. And I'm turning it around. Instead of the Free State uh, Project sponsoring me, I'm sponsoring y'all. And uh, there's probably several other sponsors that as they decay, there'll be other organizations that I deem worthy. But you guys get to go first uh, because I really believe in what your guys are doing. And I know you always say to the speaker at the end, when are you going to move to New Hampshire? Folks, I don't know if it'll ever happen. <laughs> and I want to say to you guys, that doesn't mean that we don't fight for the same fight. We don't fight for the same side. We're not doing the same things. And some of you guys have come a long way to be here. And you may never move here as well. Wherever you are. Wherever you're at, wherever you've decided to throw down and fight, keep fighting because they're scared, folks. They're scared because when we become independent, we don't need them, and they know that. That's why they don't like things like the survival movement. It's not because they're really afraid of what we'll do. It's afraid that we will not need them anymore. I don't need them. That's what I want for you, too.